Good morning in these early hours of the morning. If you went to bed early and you just woke up now and you want to know what's going on, there is still no decision yet in the presidential race. We'll give you the electoral vote first with 270 votes needed to declare a winner. Carter has 257, Ford has 160. That means that Carter just needs 13 more electoral votes and he will become the next president. The popular vote looks like this. Uh, Carter has 51% of that vote, and Ford has 48% of that vote. Carter leading that as well. If you translate those figures, the popular vote and the electoral vote, to a map of the United States, and color one guy one color and another one the other, this is the way it looks. The darker color, the blue, is Jimmy Carter. The yellow, the lighter color, is uh, Gerald Ford. The reddish areas are yet undecided. It's uh, it's not quite two countries divided by the Mississippi River, but certainly Jimmy Carter has gotten the preponderance of his strength in the East and in the South. The most recent acquisition was Texas. Harry, I don't think we've given enough attention to one factor in this campaign, and that is named Eugene McCarthy. In almost every one of these very tight states, <clears throat> McCarthy is making the difference. For example, in Maine, Ford has a one-point lead over, over Carter, but McCarthy is pulling 2% of the vote away from uh, Carter. If McCarthy were not there, Carter, Carter would presumably have a one percentage point lead over Ford. In Oregon, Ford has a three point lead over Carter, but McCarthy is pulling 4% of the vote, enough to put Carter in the lead. In hotly contested Illinois, Carter has a precarious one point lead over Ford. McCarthy is getting one percentage point, just enough to make it even. McCarthy is pulling 1% in the Ohio race in what otherwise would be a dead heat between Ford and McCarthy and, and Carter. And in Wisconsin, a race too close to call also, McCarthy is drawing 2% of the votes. So McCarthy is playing quite a role in this election tonight. If you look at it nationally, however, I think he has 1% uh, of the vote on the national level. Lester Maddox had none. Lester Maddox said earlier this evening that he thinks the outcome might have been different if, and I quote here, George Wallace hadn't joined the enemy, the enemy in uh, Maddox's terms being Jimmy Carter. In Wisconsin, where uh, Eugene McCarthy is a factor, 76% of the precincts are in, but uh, Wisconsin's 11 electoral votes are still not uh, uh, assignable to either Carter or Ford, although Carter maintains a regular three per uh, rep steady 3% lead over President Ford in spite of the Eugene McCarthy vote. If Wisconsin came in, that would give uh, Carter 268 votes, he'd be too short. And at that point, he, one of a number of states could put him over. Oregon, Hawaii, Maine, any one of them. Mm -hmm. Barbara? And uh, there is still California sitting out there with its 45 electoral votes. We're going to go now to the Ford headquarters where Charles Gibson has a report for us. <coughs> This is the ballroom of the Sheraton Park Hotel in Washington, which was intended to be the site for what the Ford people still hope will be the victory party for the Ford Dole ticket. There has been about four to 6,000 people in this room through the night. Their enthusiasm has stayed relatively high. A lot of them have left, but that was primarily because they ran out of food more than anything else. They have kept the enthusiasm up with some music. Lionel Hampton and Al Hurd have been playing uh, throughout the evening, a little dancing, but for the most part, the crowd has been keeping track of results on a giant television screen, and I am now up on that screen, if you can hear people yelling in the background. It has been a unique way of keeping enthusiasm up because the, it's just one screen. It's about 15 feet high. You can barely see it behind me. And the Ford people make sure that there are good results up on that. There is someone flipping channels, and they make sure they find the good reports for the president. And they have a typewriter which types information into that screen, and they have made sure that the crowd has heard a lot about the states that the president has been carrying, and not much about the states where he hasn't been doing very well. They are waiting, of course, for the president to come. The Ford people said the president would be down about 11 o'clock. That hour has slipped back and back and back, and now they say the president will come when he has something definitive to say. And once the president has told this crowd they can go home, then probably at that time they will. Charles Gibson, ABC News, in the Sheraton Park Hotel in Washington. Thank you, Charles. We thought you might want to know from time to time how we go about making the projections that we do. At the heart of our projection system is the League of Women Voters. 
The League has volunteers in our 3,000 key election precincts across the country, and as the polls close in the state, a woman in each precinct telephones the early vote count to other volunteers you see for our, here at our computer center in Connecticut. And using that early raw vote and information already in the computer, our specialists project who has won. But the whole thing depends on the conscientious women in our key precincts, and their record through several elections with us has been all but perfect, and we are very grateful to them. We want to give you the national popular vote at this point. Carter has 51% of that vote, 31,478,000, and Ford 48% of that vote with 29,583,000, and so on. We want to, at this point, just tell you what the popular vote is in California. California still, uh, we're not ready to call California, but the, the popular vote in uh, California is 100 and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm finding it difficult to read that vote there. There, there you can see it clearly yourself. The Democrats 50%, Carter 50%, the Republicans 49%, Carter 803,000 some, almost 804, and Ford 794. Now, there are breakdowns of the votes that we've had tonight uh, so that we can tell perhaps how things have gone. It was said that if there was a large black turnout, it would help Jimmy Carter. And to give us a picture of what the national lookout is on the ethnic vote, we'll turn things over now to Lou Harris, and he'll tell us the results. Uh, Barbara, what we've got here is a curious pattern. Uh, Jimmy Carter tried, after the Democratic Convention, to put together the old New Deal coalition. He's only partially succeeded tonight. He's done very well in the big cities. He's done extremely well with the union vote, where he has a 19-point lead. But it's among the ethnics where you begin to get some splits here. Uh, what you've got are the blacks and the Spanish-speaking coming in very heavily for Carter. But you've got the white Catholics, mainly in the north, in the east and the Midwest, where Jimmy Carter's been hurt tonight. There's no doubt of that. The reason it's close in states like Ohio and Illinois right at this moment is because the Catholic vote did not come in for Carter, such as old-time majorities would dictate. He's also been off, and what made New York very close tonight is that the Jewish vote, for example, was 54 to 44 percent for Carter, way off what should have been at least a two-to-one margin. So you do have a kind of breakup of that old New Deal coalition and made up again by Jimmy Carter being very strong among uh, white Protestants. I hate to put it on such a bald basis, but you see this break in the vote. And when it's there, I think we have an obligation to report it. It's a curious kind of division. I'd say probably this uh, New Deal coalition likely won't last through another election. Barbara? I just wonder, Lou, how close does this come to what you have predicted? Do you feel very confident about your predictions? Is this well, the way Barbara, it's broken down? Barbara, let me say, we reported our final poll, I'm proud to say, uh, did show uh, Ford ahead by one point among the Catholics, and by gosh, it's come out that way. We showed the Jewish vote softening up in the last 10 days. That's the religious issue. There is a religious issue, but there's a reverse religious issue that it's helped Carter. Lou, I uh, uh, have only one argument with you. I remember, um, I remember being in the old Stockyards Amphitheater in Chicago in 1960, uh, when with working with Walter Cronkite, and he said, well, this is the last time we'll be in this old building. And uh, so they built McCormick Place, and it burned down. And sure enough, they were back in the, the Stock Theater in 1968. And it seems to me, I have heard people, not you, but I have heard people say for a number of presidential elections, well, that's the end of the old New Deal coalition. We'll, well see. Harry, Harry, it still has some life, and if Jimmy Carter wins this, he'll owe his life to major portions of that. Make no mistake about it, the black vote came in for him, the Spanish-speaking and the Union people. Uh, let me say their turnout, turnout was about the same this time, maybe one point better nationwide. Our figures show the union did, unions did get out their vote. Well, isn't it possible that eight years, say, if you had eight years of a president heading the New Deal coalition and a Congress giving them some of the things they wanted, it might be stronger than it is now? Well, you might, but I'm not sure that uh, the Catholics, the Jews, who are getting pretty affluent these days, are going to really uh, go back to that old pork chop type politics. I think, uh, in a way, we see the impact of affluence 
which does tend to knock out some of these old-fashioned ties that people seem to have. Did the union get up? And the Excuse union? me, we're going now to the Carter headquarters where Mrs. Coretta King is about to speak. I just got that message on this earpiece. Country. There are thousands of people, perhaps millions of people gathered in halls across this country tonight like we are here in Atlanta. But there's no doubt that the spotlight is on Atlanta, Georgia. I think it's remarkable that this campaign has involved so many people across this country who have given so much of themselves. And I certainly want to commend you because many of you have worked long, hard hours giving of your time and your talent and of your means because you know that there must be a change in this country if this country is to survive. You know, what has already happened has been historical. And I would say that starting from 22 months ago when Jimmy Carter began his long trek toward the White House, what he has accomplished in bringing people together throughout this country has been truly remarkable. Don't let anybody tell you that it has not. When I look at the composition of this audience, and when I have watched the composition of the campaign and its workers, the staff, as I have traveled across this country, during the last two months. I don't think we've had a campaign like this in the history of this nation. That represents real progress. This is Martin Luther King, Jr. That is Coretta King speaking from Atlanta. She has, of course, been a supporter of Jimmy Carter, as you've heard. And she has been involved primarily in her own life in uh, working towards a center in Atlanta for a great variety of social activities and other activities in memory of her husband and uh, in his name. We will come back with more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We're back at our election night headquarters just to bring you some uh, news on how California is going. Overall, it's a standoff at this hour. The election is still too close to call, but Jimmy Carter is leading in the farm, rural, and metropolitan areas, and Gerald Ford has a substantial lead, almost 60% of the votes cast in the suburbs and the small towns. Still too close to call. We are going to have in this country two women governors. We already have one, the governor of the state of Connecticut, Ella Grasso, and we now have another one in the state of Washington. Washington has elected a woman governor. ABC News projected Dixie Lee Ray, a winner in that race, over John Spellman, her Republican opponent. And this is what she had to say to her supporters. And as we move back along the road to getting our government working for its people, all I can say is that success, if indeed that's what it is tonight, and I'm very confident, success is due to the support, to the hard work, to the belief, to the confidence, the people that are in this room. It's you and many people like you throughout the state that saw to it that the experts were wrong the citizens did go to the polls and voted, and you confounded all of them, and I think that's great. That's great. Yeah.
Yeah. And it's the people that are electing your representatives. You, the people, are electing your representatives. They're not being elected by the publishers and the editors of the daily newspapers. Dixie Lee Ray, who's the next governor of Washington, a woman who keeps five dogs. Yes. And in Washington, she didn't live in a house, she lived in a trailer with her five dogs the whole time she was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. Once we got honorary doctorates at Ripon College and there was a demonstration against her, so I manly stood between her and the demonstrators, but she took my place and she did a much better job than I did. <laughs> Just to bring you up to date a little bit on how the races are going, we said we will now have two women governors. This is the Dixie Lee Ray is the first woman elected in this election. In Congress, we're going to have at least two new uh, members. They're both Democrats. One is from Baltimore. Her name is Barbara Mikulski. She is described as flamboyant, and some say she will replace in personality Bella Abzug. And the other, Mary Rose Okar and she is from um, Cleveland City. She was, a, she was a former councilwoman in Cleveland City. So uh, the account had been 19 women in uh, the House of Representatives. I don't know. At, at, right now, it's at least 18. So it looks as if uh, there will be very little change, or there may be a couple more. OK, we'll bring you more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We heard just a few moments ago from Ford headquarters in Washington. Now we want to go uh, to the Democratic headquarters in Washington. Bill Matinee is there to bring us a report. Bill? Barbara, I'm here. Uh, we've got a party going on here. In fact, this party has been going on for seven hours and 15 minutes. Rather than a party, I might describe it as organized bedlam. Two rock bands have been blasting away during the entire time, and the libation has been flowing quite freely during that entire period. This is the Democratic National Committee headquarters party. It's called a victory party, and everybody here uh, is celebrating a victory despite the closeness of the race. Not once during this evening uh, have the spirits of this uh, crowd of... Uh, Oh, a thousand or so people uh, then flagged uh, by the closeness of the race. This band uh, earlier played um, an old Bill Haley rock tune from the 1960s called Rock Around the Clock. Well, they've rocked away the night, and many of them tell me they will rock, rock, rock till the broad daylight, of, at least until Jimmy Carter's hand has been raised in victory. So from the... Democratic National Headquarters Victory Party here in downtown Washington, Barbara. Back to you. Bill, you're just going to learn how to rock. Jack, can't you stand there? You got to, well, we'll stand up and show you how to do it later. We want to give you the national, I wish I knew how to do it, the national electoral vote. Carter has 257 at this point, and Ford has 160. That's how the electoral vote looks at this time. I still uh, have some states. We've divided up our states among the three of us. And we'll come back and uh, go through all our various states, tell you where they are now. That's the National Election Night story at uh, 52 minutes after the hour.